one of my favorite students that I've had on it. So I know sometimes we do have favorites. It's just um, the reason she's amazing is because um, about four, five, five years ago, four years ago, she came into my office um, for Chem 116, and once she asked the question, so what's the deal with hydrogen bonding? Oh my gosh, two hours later I was still talking. But, that was a long chat. Yes. <laughs> um, but I showed her some images of some hydrogen bonding, actually hydrogen bonds that they had taken with atomic force microscopy, and her eyes truly glistened with tears. Um, so the passion that she has for chemistry uh, shines through in so many different ways. I'm so excited to have had her for now five years. Um, and in that five years, she's not only been a star chemist, but also a star singer, um, being very active in the conservatory. So. You are a master of so many things, so I'm so fortunate. I'm, thank you for being my student. Um, and so in that, she also accompanied me to Oak Ridge National Lab, and that's what she's going to talk about today. Um, and Jade would also like to thank you because uh, uh, Nikki was uh, uh, basically a proxy for me in the laboratory um, over the summer when I was pregnant and I couldn't actually go into the laboratory to do a lot of things. So thank you for that, she said as well. So without further ado, I flip this card. My name is Nikki, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the research that Allison and I did at Oak Ridge National Lab this past summer, which involves measuring how fast molecules move through liquids, and we use a form of spectroscopy called fluorescence correlation spectroscopy to conduct this research. But before I get into the details, I want to take a second and ask that you consider the state of our atmosphere. Recently, atmospheric concentrations of CO2 have sur surpassed 400 parts per million. And this is an issue because we haven't seen this concentration of CO2 in millions of years. And this is a problem because CO2 is a greenhouse gas, which means it contributes to the overall warming of the globe. So if we imagine a bunch of CO2 in our atmosphere, more than we've seen in a million years, then this is potentially an issue of why we see this rise in the overall average of the global temperature. So there's a lot of research going into how we can fix this issue. Specifically, our research asks, how can we help fix the specific CO2 problem? So imagine, you're in a material science lab, and you're, you have this magic material that somehow, if it could absorb CO2 from the environment and retain all of the same properties that we already know about it, that would be amazing. And so this is one specific material that our lab looked at, which is ionic liquids. And there's a lot of literature that has shown that they have great potential for CO2 absorption from the environment. So what are ionic liquids? Well, here's a picture of the three that we studied extensively. They look pretty unassuming. But to define them, they are liquid salts, or ionic compounds. And this means that they are composed of a positive molecule and a negative molecule interacting together. One quality about them is that they're green solvents, which means that they're really a really nice liquid to dissolve stuff in. So think about all the nasty stuff that you and the audience have used in organic chemistry, like benzenes and other just really nasty and dangerous um, solvents that you've used. Ionic liquids could be a potential green solvent for the future that wouldn't harm the environment. It could be a great replacement. But the most important quality of ionic liquids are that they're designer solvents. And we can change a ton of their properties, such as viscosity, density, and polarity, just by changing which positive and negative molecule we have together. So consider this Venn diagram where we have common cations, the positive molecule, and common anions, the negative molecule. You could take any two that you want from either side and put it together and get some type of ionic liquid. And hence, we get these tunable physical properties with this really interesting material. So here we see this relationship between structure and function that I'm sure all of you have heard in your science classes, but this is really key to this specific project. So our research, research objective asks, or wants to figure out, the relationship between structure and dynamics in ionic liquids. But this should sound strange to you, because the words liquid and structure shouldn't really meld in our brains. But there's more to the story. So when we think about liquids normally, we think about them as a random conglomeration of molecules with no specific orientation. But there are two 
additional types of liquid structure that we can find, such as aggregation, where some molecules orient together in some way, and liquid crystals, which is where all the molecules are, orient are fully oriented. And this is really confusing, and I don't know much about this. But ionic liquids are really special because they show this special type of aggregation. And this aggregation is governed by intermolecular forces. And intermolecular forces are exactly what they sound like. There's a couple different types, but they're just a type of force that either would cause an attraction or repulsion of, of molecules together. A consequence of this aggregation is that we get different domains inside of ionic liquids. So we have inside of this liquid one region and another region all mixed together, so it's not homogeneous. And we can define domain as a section of liquid made up of similar molecular components. So a preview, we can look at this image and see that the molecules that aggregate this way have polar interactions, which are positive and negative interactions. And coulombic is the official name of the intermolecular force that governs the polar domain. And this nonpolar domain, which is everything outside of it, is aggregated by neutral interactions or van der Waals forces. And van der Waals, again, are another name for a type of intermolecular force. And you're all familiar with this concept when you think about oil and water. We know water is a very polar molecule because of its uneven electron distribution. And we know oil is a very nonpolar molecule because the electron density is the same throughout the molecule. And we know from experience that oil and water don't mix. But ionic liquids add more to the story because they have this polar and nonpolar section on the same molecule. So when we go back and look at the ionic liquids we used, we don't see this very macro aggregation. It's on the nanoscale. And so we get nanodomains inside of ionic liquids. So we can think about all of this aggregation in terms of the game we all know called Plinko. So remembering that ionic liquids are vast in structural differences and that different ionic liquids aggregate differently, we can infer information about the structure of the ionic liquid by measuring diffusion or how a specific molecule is moving through the liquid. So if we put our little balls at the top of the board and if we could somehow zoom in on a specific part of the board, depending on how fast the ball moves through, we can see how little or how many pegs that the Plinko boards have. So this project really examines this relationship between dynamics and structure, and it's a mutual relationship. You can approach it from either angle, but our approach with this project was to investigate the dynamics, so measure the motion to understand the ionic liquid structure, or see if we can understand the specifics of these nanodomains that I've talked about. So, in short, let's measure diffusion in pure ionic liquids. So, these are the three ionic liquids that I showed you the pictures of. This is ionic liquid 1, ionic liquid 2, and ionic liquid 3. To look at their composition, they all have the same anion, which is this TF2N molecule, and it has this negative charge on the nitrogen, and they have the same base cation, which, which is this ammonium-based um, center. And an ammonium-based is just a nitrogen with four bonds coming off of it, and that gives us this positive charge, making the cation part of the molecule. And the change in our system is the alkyl tail length of the ionic liquids. And an alkyl tail is just a carbon chain. So when we look at the names of the ionic liquids, we can see that this N1114 represents one carbon, one carbon, one carbon, four carbons. And then for the next one, we have one single carbon chain and three four carbon chains. And then consequently, one carbon chain, three eight length carbon chain, three eight long carbon tails. So why these specific ionic liquids? Well, first, they're relatively cheap and available, which is important for every research project. But I'll convince you that they're structurally interesting because of this aggregation I've mentioned, and they're dynamically interesting. So first, they're structurally interesting because of this aggregation concept that I've introduced. They segregate into two nanodomains, the polar and the nonpolar. 
and these are governed by the intermolecular forces that I've mentioned. So we have the polar domain to review, um, domi dominated by Coulombic forces, so this positive and negative charge, and this nonpolar domain, formed by the alkyl tails, which is dominated by Van der Waals intermolecular forces. And to get a um, simple picture of what this could look like, this is a good one. So we have these sections of positive and negative charges aggregating in certain places, and then we have these pockets of tails interacting together. And I want to emphasize, liquid structure is a really weird concept. And ionic liquids are not liquid crystals, but they're somewhere in between, no orientation at all, and complete orientation within this material. And this adds complexity, because we're not just looking at bulk dynamics anymore. Bulk dynamics don't tell the whole story. So when we go back to this miracle material that's going to save the environment, once it absorbs CO2, there just are more questions to ask. Which domain does it go in, and how does it change the overall properties of the liquid once it absorbs the CO2? And it supports why we need this basic research. So what would this material look like on a molecular level? Some scientists have asked this question, and they performed a, uh, I don't know, test? They, could, they took data on the molecule, and it's called a molecular dynamic simulation, and this is what it looks like. So let's dive into what this picture shows. So we have blue, red and blue parts and gray parts. And the red and blue parts represent the polar domain that I've mentioned, and the gray represents the nonpolar domain that I've mentioned. And so taking an MD simulation of ionic liquids is one way of asking, how are the Plinko pegs changing? How can we investigate this structure directly? And to color coordinate, we have these positive and negative charges represented by the blue and red, and the, and the neutral gray section representing the nonpolar. So when we look at this, we can see as alkyl tail lengths are increasing, the larger nonpolar domain that we see, which makes sense because if there's more of this nonpolar stuff, then we should see more of the gray parts. So that all is as expected. But things get more interesting when we compare the first two ionic liquids, 1114 to 1444. And these are interesting because the alkyl tail variations are not symmetric. And what I mean by this is as the alkyl tail lengths are changing, N1114 is changing differently than the other two. So what would make it symmetric is if we have these three eight tails going to three four tails, then the next symmetric change would be three one tails. And so we don't see that with this ionic liquid, which is what makes it interesting. And so we took XRD, or X-ray diffraction data, to measure these organizations inside of the domains. And we can measure different types of distances within the organization, such as atom adjacency, charge distances, and polarity distances. And so this is just a really cool method that we can even see how all of these distances are changing just based on alkyl tail length. And so the first peak that we see is this adjacency peak, and the second peak that we see is this charge peak. And we can see that when we compare the two, the very tops of the peaks don't line up with each other. And so this is a way to, this is our way of saying these nano domains are very different in structure. And again, the asymmetries of these alkyl tails are affecting the organization of these domains. So now when we throw 1888 into the picture, we have this blue plot and a new peak, the polarity peak, is introduced, which I will touch on at the end. But when we look at this plot, we can see that the blue and red peaks match much better together than does the gray. The gray, this N1114, is the odd ionic liquid out in this situation. So we can conclude from the plot that the red and blue, or these two ionic liquids, have similar organizations. And this makes sense when we think about the alkyl tail symmetries being the same. So again, the gray is the odd one out. Now, they're dynamically interesting when we consider viscosity data. So remember, viscosity is 
You can think about viscosity as momentum transport or a liquid's resistance to deformation. So just some examples, water is not viscous at all, but honey is extremely viscous. So despite having these ammonium based Despite having an ammonium-based system, there seems to be one outlier when we look at viscosity plotted against temperature. It's the gray again. So something fishy is happening with this N1114 ionic liquid. So how do we investigate these domains individually? We need a probe for each region, and this is the falling ball in our Plinko, ball, or our Plinko board analogy. Which makes sense, because if we have two domains, we need one dye for each domain. So we have two fluorescent dyes, R6G and DCM. And we know, or we chose these dyes for the domains based on the like dissolves like rule. So R6G, based on this positive charge on the nitrogen, is a cationic molecule. And for the same reasons that, um, that these liquids aggregate in the first place into molecular forces, this positive charge is going to be interacting with the other negative charges in the polar domain. So it's going to be in the polar domain. And DCM is a neutral molecule, so it's going to prefer the nonpolar domain. So the basis for this investigation was that the GLOW group showed that these probe molecules show biphasic diffusion, or two diffusions, which adds more to the story. Because we know that R6G has its dominant domain in the polar, and DCM has its dominant domain in the nonpolar. Well, turns out a very small percentage of the dyes wind up in the other one when we put them into the liquids. So to reinforce, much higher percentage of the dye is found in its dominant domain, but we still see a diffusion of a small percentage of the molecules in the other domain. And to add to the story, the dominant domain diffusions are slower, again, due to these intermolecular forces. And like dissolves like. So we know the reasons for these aggregations are the intermolecular forces. And for the same reasons why they aggregate in the first place, we know that these molecules are going to prefer their respective domains, and as a consequence of that, diffuse much slower through them. And we can think about this in terms of Plinko by thinking that the balls have Velcro on them in their dominant domains. So let's look at this. So remembering that R6G likes polar and DCM likes nonpolar, the dyes suddenly get really sticky. And as they're moving down the board, it's going to move so much slow, slower than it would move through the other domain. So, let's review and compare Plinko boards and consider DCM first. Recalling that its dominant domain is nonpolar, and as apical tail length in increases, its diffusion, diffusion speed decreases. This reason is because there's more Van der Waals interactions. So when we look at these Plinko boards and consider that the increasing number of pegs has to do with the increasing number of carbons on the tails, we know that the ball is going to move slower through the longer chains. And with R6G, remembering that its dominant domain is the polar, as alkyl tail length increases, diffusion speed will decrease, but this is because of a different reason. When we look at the ND simulations, as the amount of gray matter is increasing, we can see that the blue and red polar sections are becoming a bit more separate and isolated like islands. This causes the dye, when it goes into the liquid, to have a much higher density inside these smaller pockets. And so when it has this higher density, the same thing's going to happen. It's going to interact more and be slower. So when we look at the pencil boards, and consider this time that the pegs have to do with the density of the molecules, a higher density in a smaller space, we're going to see a similar situation where the ball will be moving slower through the areas where there's higher density. So our goal is to measure how these balls are moving at all. And the method that we use to do this is called fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, which is now very near and dear to my heart. But the general idea of this method is that we have these fluorescent molecules moving around in the liquid, and as they move through the laser, 
they're going to fluoresce. And as soon as they move out of the laser, they're going to go back to normal. And if I could just show you what this looked like, because this was probably the highlight of my research at Oak Ridge, oh, you could actually see the fluorescence with your own eyes, and it looked like glitter. And it was just insane, because every single little glitter was just one molecule. So these are just extremely fluorescent, and oh, I cried when I saw it, to be completely honest. But it was one of the coolest things ever, and I tried to take a picture, and that's the best I got. It's a terrible picture, but <laughs> you can imagine it's glittering. So before I get into the method of FCS, I'm going to give a brief overview of the purpose of this method. First, it is extremely sensitive technique that measures single molecules, which is insane. And because it measures single molecules, the instrument requires a really highly diluted solution. And this is just a fun picture that I took at the lab. This is of R6G um, in 10 to the minus 9 concentration in ethanol. And it looks pink and yellow at the same time because the pink is the actual color of the dye, but the yellow is the color of the fluorescence of the dye, just fluorescing at room light. So it just looked really cool and pretty. But the purpose of the method is that it correlates fluorescence fluctuations over time. And I also want to show some pictures of our laser from the summer, which are insanely cool. Um, so this is the source of our laser, and you can see it just goes, you can see it coming out. And then uh, it comes down our optical table, and we have a bunch of mirrors set up to direct it into the microscope. So it comes down here, goes over here, up, over, and into the microscope, which is right here. It's kind of hard to see. But those look really cool. So, to talk about the instrument, first, we have to align the laser. And I just also want to say, this little box means so much. And I have to give a shout out to Allison, because she spent her entire six-month sabbatical doing this part of the process, building the instrument and setting up the laser. So this little box just does not represent how much it took to even get this step in the first place. And we still even had to uh, fiddle with it a little bit when we were there. So the next part is the confocal microscope. So as the laser comes through the objective and converges at this point, when we zoom in, we see a confocal volume. And this is the area where the molecules are going to fluoresce in. And as this fluorescence light comes back down through the microscope, um, the APD measures this fluorescence in, ter uh, excuse me, in terms of intensity over time. And we can correlate these intensity fluctuations to get data. So that's what data looks like. That's the sparkles. <laughs> <laughs> and from this data, we can use some equations to get diffusion, which is the entire goal of the project. And small detail they'll touch on a few slides later, diffusion is inversely related to the residence time of the molecule in the confocal volume. So our goal was to get diffusion, but before we can do this, we need to know the exact volume of the confocal volume. And this is important because this is how we calibrate the instrument in general, but there's a number of mathematical steps to get diffusion from knowing the volume of this confocal volume. So this was a beast of the project. This probably took over half of our time trying to get this. But it was time well spent, because we need to know, as close as we can, the volume of this area where the molecules are fluorescing if we're measuring how fast they're going through it over time. So we used the diffusion method to get this volume. And basically what this says is, hey, if we know already really well how a molecule moves through a specific liquid, we can take that diffusion that we already know and then work backwards to get the, the volume parameters. So there's a lot of literature that supports R6G in water diffuses at 426 microns per second at a concentration of 5 times 10 to the 9 molar, which is very small. So there are three steps to get the volume. First, we find this residence time that I mentioned of the molecule, 
inside the confocal volume, and we get this from the data. Remembering that g of tau is a correlation function, we can fit this function to an equation that we know is basically the shape of the plot. And we put this into a program called Origin, and basically what the program does is when we put in the data and put in the equation, it magically fits the equation to our data and spits out all of these variables that we don't know their values. So it's pretty easy. But this is how we get tau, or residence time. Next, we can find R0, or this x, or this radial dimension of the confocal volume. And we get it from this equation, where we have 4 times diffusion, which is the diffusion we know, thankfully, times this TD, or residence time, that we just got in the first step. Finally, we get the volume of the confocal volume from this equation, and we get this R0 just from the previous step, and this Z0, which is the axial dimension, from this special relationship, W0, which we also found from this initial step. So, after all of that, our average confocal volume was about 4 femtoliters, which is 4 times 10 to the minus 15 liters. And that is just so small for some perspective, depending on the liquid or how concentrated that we had the dyes in the liquid, there is between 4 to 60 molecules inside this volume. And I want to emphasize again, just this was an extremely significant part of the project, because if we're measuring distance over time, we need to have a really good idea, again, of this volume. So as the ball is moving down, we have a sense of how far it moves. And as the dye is moving through this confocal volume, we know just how long it spent fluorescing in there at all. And then from this, we get the beautiful data. So I'm just going to teach you how you can read a correlation function. And I invite you to think like a molecule for this slide. So imagine your molecule and you are moving really slowly. If you're moving really slowly, you're going to spend a lot of time fluorescing in that confocal volume. But if you're moving really fast, you're going to be spending a lot less time in the confocal volume because you're going to be zipping through. These different speeds are represented in the different attenuations, which is just the slope down here to the x-axis of the plot. So the slow diffusion, the plot is going to attenuate much farther to the right, and the fast diffusion, the plot is going to attenuate to the left. And so we can have this nice relationship that allows us to compare the speeds of the molecules. Oh, and this is the beautiful equation that we use to fit our data. It's a beast, but we're going to unpack it. So reading the math, what does each of these parts mean? Well, first, we have a sum, and this represents that biphasic diffusion I've mentioned which is the two, do two diffusions for these two nanodomains. We have an N that represents the mean number of molecules in the confocal volume, which I've mentioned is about 4 to 60, depending. We have an alpha that represents the percentage of the molecules in domains. So remember, I mentioned that each dye has their preferred domain. In general, it's about 80 to 90% for that domain, and then about 10 to 20% for its non-dominant domain. And then we have D, which is the diffusion coefficient, which is the goal of this entire project. T represents the time. And R0 and Z0 are these radial and axial dimensions that we just spent a slide talking about how we get in the first place. And again, this is a picture to remind. And in short, this function shows how much fluorescence changes with time, which is the whole goal. So, Let's play a real game of Plinko now. Yay. <laughs> so remembering, we have three ionic liquids, which are represented by these two Plinko boards. I don't have a third, because you can just imagine more pegs on a third one. We have our balls, which represent our dyes. And our goal is to find the, these two diffusions per dye, with one diffusion representing each domain. So as the balls move down, zoomed in, we get sparkles when they're inside the circle. And from these sparkles, we get 
our plot, our autocorrelated plot, which contains our diffusion coefficients. And we can compare slow and fast diffusion, recalling this example, where the fast diffusions are the plots that attenuate to the left, and the slow diffusions um, attenuate um, more to the right. So with this, here is our result with R6G. And it's kind of hard to see, but this is the gray, and then these are the red and blue over here. This is our GCM results. And I'm going to put them together on the same slide for you. Does anybody notice an odd one out? <laughs> As is part of the entire story, gray or N1114 seems to be this weird ionic liquid. Both dyes diffuse significantly faster through this ionic liquid than the other two. Another conclusion is that diffusion through 1444 and 1888 is extremely similar. They attenuate very similarly on the x-axis. So we can, when we think about this in terms of Plinko, we have basically two boards. We have a ball moving faster through one system and a ball moving at very similar speeds through the other two. So, yes. And to put numbers to this, first consider the dominant domain. And this is a lot to take in. But over here, we have it divided by dye, and then the three ionic liquids per dye. So we can see for its dominant domain, the gray N114 has a diffusion of 5.5 and 7.8 for both dyes. And then, the, um, and then for the other two dyes, it's less than one. So we have a diffusion that's much faster through 1114. And similarly, in our second domain, we have a diffusion of 35 and 112 for the 1114, and then about 8 to 9 for the other two. So there's just something really weird going on with this 1114. And when we consider the structure, we have one type of structure for 1114 and a different type of structure for two ionic, li two ionic liquids. So the nano domains are very similar in this case. So some musings on why we think N1114 is weird. Well, first, this goes back to this symmetry that I've mentioned with the XRD beta. This 1114 symmetry with the alkyl tail variation is just different than the 1444 and 1888. They're not symmetric with each other. And so this Lima group uh, did some MD simulations that showed that due to this asymmetry, their intermolecular forces that govern the domains at all actually are different, which is weird and insane. But 1114 has a higher percent of van der Waals intermolecular forces that govern these domains, and 1444 has a higher percent of Coulombic. And so this has led scientists to ask, well, is the nonpolar phase of 1114 more ordered due to the single alkyl tail? which is basically to ask, because we have this one tail, we can stack them in an ordered fashion much more easily than we can try and stack three together. Well, we don't know, because this is a hot debate in the literature right now. There's like three groups that say it is, and three groups that say it isn't, and it's a hot topic in the chem world. And, but this all goes back to the structure and function relationship that is just crucial. It's at the heart of this project. So some conclusions. We know that these ionic liquids are structurally interesting because we have x-ray data that confirm the structure of 1114 is different than 1444 and 1888. And we also have these MD simulations that confirm that adding alkyl tails is not trivial. When we add more carbons, the phases change. And this is just an important conclusion. A dynamics, a dynamics conclusion that we can make is that our viscosity data shows that 1114 is just an outlier from the other two in a different way. Its viscosity is it's much less viscous than the other two. And for, for some conclusions about our FCS, in short, 
both dyes diffuse faster through 1114, and the dyes diffuse very similarly through the other two. And this just goes to show that alkyl tail length dependence is non-trivial, and structure is non-trivial to dynamic studies. So some future work for this project would involve getting data for ionic liquid N1118, which is an ionic liquid I haven't mentioned yet, but this would provide that symmetric variation from the 1114 that would allow it for that would allow it to have a much more fair comparison. So when we get data for this ionic liquid, like viscosity and density and FCS, if it has similar um, dynamics to 1114, then we can confirm that this ionic liquid has a similar structure and confirm that these different types of alkyl tails, depending on the symmetry, will have different or similar nanodomain structures. Another point is to actually put CO2 in the now studied ionic liquid systems and test how these properties change upon absorption. I also want to have a small anecdote and say this is actually what we went to Oak Ridge to do, but due to ordering issues, um, we couldn't actually get these little capillaries to put the gas in the ionic liquids anyway, and we would have had to basically figure out an entire system to do it safely. And no one had done FCS yet on the ionic liquids alone, so we did this and the CO2 is the next step in this project. And finally, an interesting thing to look at would, to get, would be to get small angle x-ray scattering to see if we can get any polarity peaks from the other two ionic liquids. So when I talked about the polarity peak with the blue, we can see that these red and grays are going up at the smaller angles, but we just didn't have a small enough angle to get to see if there are even polarity peaks with those ionic liquids. So it would be really interesting to see if we could get any peaks from there and make any more conclusions. So to make some acknowledgments, first, Allison, for always believing in me and for taking me to Oak Ridge in the first place. Um, all the chem department faculty for teaching me so much and for, again, believing in me. And Daniel for being the heart of the chem lab, <laughs> truly. And the chem department senior class, I have come to you for so many things, and I love all of you so much. And of course, Oak Ridge Basic Energy Sciences and the program that thankfully took my application, and everybody involved there. And this is a fun picture that was taken of Allison and I aligning the laser in the daylight. <laughs> it was just to, it was to put on the website, and you can't take that in the dark. But that is what I have for you, so thank you. changing up the church late at all, or you can stick with that one and just keep adding tails? Or like different numbers? Well, um, we could do that. Okay. I mean, it, it's just, you could, have, there are so many types, you yeah. know? Like, you, there's a bunch of different molecules you could clash together, and these were just the ones that we happened to use. And we, we looked at these, too, because these other papers that we were looking at that are currently debating the organization used these. So we were trying to contribute to the same systems currently being studied by using FCS, which hasn't been done before. And did you guys synthesize these, or did you have these? They, we ordered them. Okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> Any other questions? So the overarching application is to like implement this um, in like industry so that when our CO2 emissions is like absorbed and things like that. But I'm just wondering, like because it's ammonium-based, are there other potential like issues with that, like environmentally? I just, I don't know. Sorry. Not to my knowledge. Um, I know these are pretty inert. Um, I also would imagine that coating these on the inside of smokestacks would probably be like worth. I don't know the absorption of CO two that like doesn't even get out at all versus. Like, I don't know. I don't really think there are safety issues with these, to my knowledge. Can I just follow up on that? Because mm -hmm. I was going to ask how you're assessing green. And the reason I'm asking that is because when you put up that slide, 
it's everything they put up when they put up CFCs. And and I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure you have an answer, but I feel like there needs to be a statement here. In general, I did some googling. Um, that um, we have to remember that this is a whole life cycle assessment, and I believe the green statement you made is mostly about toxicity. Oh, like in the very first slide? In, in your very first slide. Yes, yes. And that is not necessarily just green. And okay. so um, there does seem to need to be quite a lot of work before you, that green statement is fully supported, unless you know differently. Well, it's a generalized statement of, uh, if you look at the battery industry with the acidity of like the iPad batteries and stuff, that these are the replacement. So it falls under that category of green. But if you look at the full cycle. Right, right. So that's, that's how the in comparison to the, the current um, electrochemical materials that are used, um, so that's how the green is being used in, in this row. But you're, you're absolutely right. It doesn't contain, or doesn't, it's not the biggest umbrella statement of green. Yeah, because it's not a t it's addressing how you make it and right. what happens after. Right. It's just the use. Yes. Sorry. No, <laughs> it's okay. But that's it's a, fair that brings up a great question, or a great point of, yeah. um, in, in developing in material science and you're developing all these materials, there's, there's always going to be some <laughs> cost benefit analysis, and so there, there is going to be a, a negative attribute to some of these materials, but in comparison to what's being used currently, you know, in which path. And so you have to really look at all these different, or look at these systems from all these different perspectives. Yeah, in, in all steps of it, not yeah. just the use step. Um, I was going to ask what laser you used and what wavelength it was at. 514 nanometer argon laser. Thank you. Do you know what its power was? Pi. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I know the class, it was like a class three, uh, like a one to four scale. Yes? Um, so you measured how fast they were moving through with liquid, but you measured while they were fluorescent, right? Yes. Um, would it help to talk about kind of like this, through how we set it up? Well, I was wondering, doesn't fluorescing them change their energy, making them they move differently because of that? Like, because they're fluorescing? Yeah, doesn't that excite them to move quicker? I think it excites their electrons, not how fast they're moving through. Huh. I don't think the fluorescence affects their diffusion. So when it's diffusing, I mean, so it's just going one way through this laser. When I think of diffusion, I think of like a balancing act, kind of, like the shot laser that gets to one side and the other. How do you stop it from like going back and forth? You know? Well, there are two. There are two ways that I can answer that. First, um, once the dyes get into their domain, they don't go back and forth. So for example, like once R6G goes into the polar domain, it doesn't go into the nonpolar at all. So the dyes are stuck in their domains. But the this is what you're talking about also um, could be answered with concentration. So when we put these dyes in the ionic liquids, it's like 10 to the minus 12. So just like a couple molecules at a time. And you're right, like theoretically, it could just like go in a circle fluorescing forever, but it, it just doesn't because it's an average of intensity. I guess what I was asking, so it was, it was diffusing across like a plane, right, where your laser was. So what's stopping it from, I, I guess I'm kind of confused with how it was like diffusing so, so it was wasn't it like, like a flow it's not or? it's not like it's diffusing across anything like they're just moving around so okay. so what we had was we had a microscope slide the laser was shining up and so we put the slide on top and then we put a drop of the ionic liquid with the dye in it and so it's literally just everything moving around inside the drop I can add how long did these measurements take like should that be asked yeah that would help um, we took um, between 40 minute to hour long measurements per um, collection. So we let it sit there for a really long time. Yeah. So that would average out, if, if one goes this way, it would average out that one going out. So it takes it into account. Cool. Um, yeah, I was wondering, do you think there's ways of controlling the aggregation of these ionic liquids? Like you could like run a field across it and orient them in some way? And then you could that would be very cool. <laughs> I think that goes well. That goes back to kind of uh, the debate in the literature right now. We don't once we once we I think know like not only that they're aggregated, but what's happening inside each domain that would help. But um, there are 
studies that show more order in domains, things move faster through them. So going back to when I was talking about 1114 being able to stack much easier, that could be um, one of the reasons why it's moving faster, just because that higher order allows it to flow better. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Unless you, have, you have something you want to say. Totally. So, um, so ionic liquids, the other thing that we didn't even touch on um, with this work is they're very conductive, which is just phenomenal for electrochemical work. Um, and so if you were to put a potential difference across it, they themselves would orient. Um, because they're so highly conductive and you'd almost push it towards that boundary of liquid crystal-like structure, but then you have a competing effect of the nonpolar domain, especially for the, N1, the 1114, um, its type of structure um, would actually compete against that orientation based off the potential difference. And so you could actually do some fine-tuning of being able to control the structure, which would then inherently control its dynamics due to conductivity, which would affect the diffusion, only because these things are charged. If it wasn't charged, if this was just some surfactant or something like that, who knows what would happen. Um, but putting it across potential differences, like the next step of, of, well, not with the CO2, but like how we can start to control these material elements. Like, like, it's so cool. <laughs> Thanks for listening.